So, welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's for yet another adult faith formation class. Today, we're going to follow our patron saint, St. John Berkman's. What was he doing 400 years ago right now? 400 years ago, the young St. John Berkman's had already felt the call to the priesthood and a desire to join the Jesuits, this young group of of priests who were missionaries. Uh, the, the, the context of his life, um, we'll find out more with the, the, the wars, the, the conflicts going on. He joins the order, makes the profession of faith uh, as, a, as a novice, and then before too long, they, they realize, wait a minute, we, we have a, a treasure with this guy. We have a little saint. We have someone who is a academically uh, uh, superior to so many of the others, even though he had to study, it's not one of those where he did, it just came naturally, which I highlight to the kids who attend our school because he is also one of the patron saints of students. And I say he's a patron saint of students, not because it just came naturally, one of those wicked smart type, uh, and then they, they understand what I mean when I say that, uh, but that he had to actually study and he did, and did well, and, and excelled. And again, the, the, his superiors recognized that so much so that they said, we want to send him to our congregation in Rome. We want him to study in Rome. And so, in order to go from Flanders to Rome, he just got on the, the next train? No, uh, certainly no planes, and not even the opportunity to go horseback and in a carriage from, from Flanders to Rome. It was a 75-day journey across the Alps, beginning right now, this time of the year. We'll see the, the time frame uh, in just a moment. And obviously, he makes that uh, journey, ends up in Rome, uh, where... Ultimately, three years later, uh, he dies. Uh, not because of this journey that we're about to talk about, but, but even more importantly, is not this 75-day journey, uh, but his journey of faith. And that's, we may not desire to take a 75-day across the, the Alps journey from modern-day Belgium to, uh, to Rome, but, um, but the journey of faith is something that we can model ourselves after uh, his journey of faith. So I'd like to invite Dr. Cheryl White, who has been to some of these places, uh, to give us this presentation. If you want to pray, we're going to find you. I will, I will leave us in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Heavenly Father, you have given us a model of purity and holiness with St. John Berkman's, who so desired to live a life in obedience to your commands and to the way of life of the Society of Jesus as founded by St. Ignatius, we ask that through his intercession, we may always be confident in our journey of faith, that everything that we've, all the uh, compulsions we feel as gifts of the Holy Spirit, guiding us, directing us, that they are indeed from you, helping us to be the people you have called us to be, and help us, even in the times of difficulty, as did St. John, to always remain true to the faith as taught us by your Son, Jesus Christ. We also know that St. John had an unbelievably beautiful devotion to Mary, and so now let us pray as he prayed so often. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So, as Father mentioned, it's been 400 years ago, and actually 400 years ago, beginning on October 24th, which is this coming Wednesday, I believe, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and the reason I, I wanted to be sure about that is because he actually left Mechlin in Flanders on October 24th, which was also a Wednesday, as it, as it, just so it, as it happens. Just 19 years old, and when he set out on this journey to Rome, uh, really incredible journey. So what I wanted to do, uh, because I think it, it, you know, it, it seems like 
It's an important centenary to celebrate, obviously 400 years, and a more important centenary because it was his journey to sainthood. Of course, he didn't know it at the time, although I suspect we have some clues that he was already thinking about, very much thinking in an eternal way, um, even on this particular journey. He lived, of course, as Father mentioned, less than three years after he arrived in Rome, two years and eight months to be exact, two years, eight months, and a few days uh, after he arrived in Rome. So Flanders, Belgium today, um, and I, I want to talk just a little bit about that because I think that, that, you know, anachronistically we think of this as Belgium. He wouldn't have known it as Belgium. Belgium, that name didn't even exist until 1830 after it declared its independence from the rest of the Low Countries, the other, the other Netherlands. Actually, at the time that St. John Berkman lived, this area was known, Flanders was part of what was called the Spanish Netherlands, uh, part of what, a, a, a deed that had been given to the Spanish crown uh, in 1566. So uh, no one would have called it Belgium. He wouldn't have known that name. Actually, the name Belgium comes from the Celtic tribe. It is associated with that region, the Belge. So, uh, again, <clears throat> didn't, didn't exist until 1830. Uh, only then, uh, really because of the independence from the rest of the Low Countries, so-called because they are at or below sea level, these provinces of the Netherlands are. And, um, and, and again, really to create a buffer zone in the 1830s between uh, the territorially aggressive French, Right, because you remember that Napoleon Bonaparte would not have been too far in the, in the distant memory of, of the 1830s, so to create a buffer zone between France and the rest of Europe. But he certainly would not have known it as Belgium. I don't know how much you wanted to know about that, but anyway, there you go. There's your lesson on Belgium today. You already know, you already know more than you did when you came here, probably. So John Bertman's, having become a Jesuit novice in 1616 at the age of 17, took his first vows on September 25th of 1618 and was sent to Antwerp, uh, also in Flanders, to continue his study. But then when he got there, he learned literally just a few weeks later that he was to go to Rome to study instead, uh, not in Antwerp, but in Rome. So uh, to continue his studies with the Jesuits. And I, what I, part of what I wanted to do today was to place this in its full context for you. Rather than make this a flat narrative about, okay, on this day he went to uh, Paris, he arrived in Lyon on this day, and then he went to Milan, I think it would be really uh, beneficial for all of us to understand the broader context of, of his life and, and what is going on specifically in Europe. What are the places like that he visited? What would those conditions have been in 1618? And, and even beginning by looking at the Jesuit order. Uh, what about the Jesuits of 1618? The Society of Jesus was thriving in 1618. Uh, there's a bit of review here I want to do for those of you that might not be too familiar with the order. But um, already by, um, by 1618, they'd only been in existence formally since 1540. So we're talking about less than a century. They have been called in later years, they've been called God's Marines. Have you ever heard that expression to refer to the Jesuits, God's Marines? Uh, they have a few things that distinguish them actually quite a bit from, uh, from other orders. No other order has spent as many man hours in prison for the faith than the Jesuits have. It's kind of a distinguishing characteristic. No other order has produced more scientists or academics than the Jesuits. And again, founded in 1540, of course, by St. Ignatius of Loyola, although Rome formally recognized the order in 1540, uh, Pope Paul III did, gave permission for the, for the formation of the order, he limited their number to just 60. There were seven original members, and he limited their number to 60 in 1540, saying they could grow no larger than that. And I think that, that begs a question, doesn't it? Why? Why would he feel the need to limit the order to 60? Well, I think there's a couple things going on here. First of all, remember that, that this is the first order to be founded after the Protestant movement swept through Europe at the beginning of the 16th century. This is the first order. And they already had the reputation in 1540 of being a little on the zealous side. Okay? And I don't mean that in a negative sense. They were zealous. And 
Their original constitution stated that their primary objectives were education and evangelization. That that's what the primary uh, mission of the order would be. So St. Ignatius of Loyola particularly believed that education was vital. It was the prime directive. It's what was necessary to not just evangelize, but, but by elevating the thinking of, of the church, to elevate the thinking of, of everyone. And um, he, he, that elevating the thinking of the church, of course, has made them somewhat controversial in the current age, I think it's fair to say, because they continue to promote free thinking. They continue to promote open theological debate. And, and in a post-enlightenment world, that reverberates very differently than it did in the 16th century. Uh, very we, we think very differently of it because of that. This has always been, though, a great tradition of the order uh, to, to do this, to challenge people to think. It has recently been said of this, and I love this quote. This is from a former superior general of the Jesuits, and it just seems so appropriate for the way we even discuss them today. Uh, he said, quote, Catholics believe that Jesuits know everything, but nothing else. <laughs> right? Does that kind of resonate? <laughs> Catholics believe that Jesuits know everything, but nothing else. And, and I think that that's very, very true. All the great medieval orders, think about this. One other reason they may have been a little bit suspicious is all the great medieval orders were named for the men who founded them. The Benedictines, the Augustinians, the Franciscans, the Dominicans were all named for their, for their founders. And along comes this group of zealots who want to name themselves after Jesus. And that was a little bit, um, I think, a little bit different, too, in, in, in that context. So Pope Julius III in 1550, now remember, 10 years has passed now, from 1540 and their formal establishment in 1550, uh, Pope Julius III lifted that, uh, that limit uh, on 60 members and said they could grow in whatever numbers God willed for them to grow. So what happened to change the mind of the papacy? Well, between, in those 10 years, between 1540 and 1550, uh, first of all, there is the first session of the Council of Trent that convenes in 1545. Jesuits had, were present at that first session of the Council of Trent and made very persuasive uh, and very emboldened uh, speeches in defense of the faith. And so Pope Julius III was so moved by that, it is said, that he lifted this and said, please, you know, grow in numbers. Have these Jesuits grow in numbers. And it was obvious by 1550 that there was not going to be any abatement of Protestantism. It wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't going away. So I think the thinking of the church was at that point in time to use the Jesuits as a tool, to use them as a, not just a teaching tool, teaching institution, but also to defend the faith. So their new constitution of 1550 is not just education and evangel evangelization as their objectives, but added to that is the third, defense of the faith. It first, first appeared in their constitution in 1550. So the order begins with seven men. They grew past 60, obviously, limited to 60 originally. Today there are more than 25,000 of them around the world. They have 41 saints that come from this order, 285 blessings. And including, of course, um, among those saints, including, of course, our own. They are, of course, responsible for spreading the spiritual exercises, the great teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, they were, from the start, very involved in science and exploration. So remember that the age we're talking about, the 16th century, we're, we're at the peak of the age of exploration and discovery. So they see, science, they see exploration as a natural extension of their scientific endeavors. And I think that this, it's a testimony to this that one-third, fully one-third of the astronomical observatories in the world that were built during the scientific revolution of the 17th and 18th centuries were established by Jesuit scientists. One-third. After the invention of the telescope in 1609, okay, 1609, one-third of them are built by Jesuit scientists. Uh, several of the world's major rivers were first explored and charted by Jesuit explorers, including, of course, the Mississippi, Jacques Marquette, right, and the Mississippi River, um, the Amazon by a Jesuit named Samuel Fritz, uh, Pedro Paez, a Spaniard um, who found the source of the Nile River, 
So these, again, all of these great things, these great accomplishments would have um, certainly contributed to the prestige of the order, for sure. Uh, and it's fair to say that at the time, even of St. John Berkman's life, that the prestigious nature of the order, the notable nature of the order, would have no doubt been a draw to someone who, as Father mentioned, was a natural scholastic, a natural academic. He would have been drawn to that kind of environment. So part of the reason the order was dissolved in 1773, and it was temporarily dissolved, I don't know how many of you know that, between 1773 and 1814, the Jesuits did not exist as an order. They were suppressed. Uh, and part of the reason that they were suppressed in, uh, in 1773 by Pope Clement XIV uh, was precisely because of the pressure he got from, from European powers. The Jesuits were, uh, as I said, prestigious. They were powerful. They seemed to operate completely autonomously from their, from their, from their countries, from their monarchs. And uh, so there was a suppression of the order that was lifted in 1814. Um, right after the Napoleonic era by Pope Pius VII. So, naturally, somebody like St. John Berkman would be drawn to this, to this order, to this environment, this great scholastic zealot group. Right? So he wrote to his father uh, to arrange a meeting in Mechlin uh, before he started off for Rome. And when he arrived in Mechlin, he learned that his father had died the week before. So uh, he did not have that final meeting with his father. But in every way, the journey that he took, I think it's fair to say, on foot, was a metaphor for his service, for his commitment to his calling and, uh, and to his holiness. It was a journey, as I can calculate it, okay, give or take, give or take a few, take a few miles, because I don't know the exact route he took. I know the major cities he traveled. So as the, I did this as the bird flies, okay? As the bird, as the bird flies. Um, so approximately 1,200 miles um, on foot. And if that took him 75 days, you can figure that's an average of 15 to 16 miles a day on foot. Uh, obviously, I'm sure that some days he traveled more than that, some days perhaps less. But we know that he left on October 24th, and we know that he arrived at the Jesuit church, Jesu, in Rome on the 31st of December, uh, 1618, on New Year's Eve, which was a Monday. Okay, so here's his journey. So he leaves Mechlin, he leaves Mechlin, and he traveled to Paris, then he traveled to Lyon, then he traveled to Milan, Loreto, and Rome. So, if you look at that journey, you might think, well, why would he go that way? Why would he go that way? Why wouldn't he take the more direct route, which was this way, right? We have a very good reason for that. And actually, this would have, had he taken the more direct route, it would have cut over 300 miles off of his journey, and which would amount to about 20, 20 days or so uh, on his journey. So, this particular route is, is interesting for a couple of reasons, if not maybe three reasons, why he did this. So where did he sleep, eat, rest, attend mass? What exact route did he take? Did he take some time in each of these great cities to see the sites that were there? If so, what did he go see? We don't know the answer to any of those questions. I know. <laughs> I know, but I think, I think, and, and putting myself sort of in his, in his shoes, and I don't mean to be presumptive, but, but knowing the sort of things that I would want to do were I in these cities, I can sort of assume that he might too. Um, so I think we can, we can draw some assumptions about where he might have gone and what he might have seen. It's also a great opportunity to talk about those places, where they were, what they were. So... We do know why he took this particular route. Europe was at war, the Thirty Years' War, a little bitty conflict. Right? Now, not as big as the Hundred Years' War, but to be fair, the Hundred Years' War took lots of time off. So, um, Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, is continuous conflict in the heart of the Holy Roman Empire. Those uh, individual little principalities of the Holy Roman Empire 
were in a constant state of a pretty bloody, bloody religious war that began the year that he set out to go to Rome, 1618. So what brought about this bloody religious war? All of the divisions that were wrought by the Protestant movement. Uh, in the heart of the Holy Roman Empire, what you have is literally dozens and dozens of individual little principalities that are all ruled by a principality, meaning they're ruled by a local prince. Many of these people were descendants of Charlemagne, this is how far uh, the lineage goes back. And together, when you think about that, together with the political disunity that had been, that already existed there, what the Protestant movement did was splinter that even further, splinter that even further between Catholics and Calvinists and Lutherans and Anabaptists who were all at war with each other, even the pacifist Anabaptists. I always find this kind of funny, you know, that... Um, do y'all know that, that really the founder of the Anabaptist movement, Ulrich Zwingli, did y'all know that he died uh, fighting in the wars of religion in a previous century? Don't you find that interesting? The Anabaptists are supposed to be pacifists. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a footnote. You can take that away if you want to. An observation. So, um, but then, yeah, these various religious strings broke into open warfare in 1618. And it is still, the, the Thirty Years' War to this day comes down to us as one of the bloodiest and most brutal wars in history. Over eight million casualties. And, and many of those were civilians. Many of those were people not engaged in combat. Uh, many of the casualties were also related, of course, to conditions that were indirectly brought about by that war, including famine. When you burn, when you burn your neighbor's crops, it affects... The peasant population. When you when you destabilize a society and cause people to live in pretty horrific conditions, it leads to outbreaks of disease like typhus. One of the worst epidemics of typhus on record is in the Holy Roman Empire during the Thirty Years' War. So we know we lost many, many people to that as well. So yes, this is why he avoided this route. And he did travel with a companion. He had a travel companion by the name of Bartholomew Pennyman. Pennyman who was also a fellow scholar, scholastic. And imagine this today. Imagine yourself doing this, which I've kind of done, in an age where you walk, you walk on the side of a major highway, I guess, um, the, uh, knowing that there's going to be rest stops, knowing that there's going to be um, food and facilities and coffee, right? Uh, it seems easy enough to, to maybe undertake a journey like this. But what I want to do is break this up kind of into three little mini, mini things here, mini sessions. First of all, I, wanted, I do want to talk about the context of the Thirty Years' War because I think we can take something away from that. Uh, why he, he took the route he did was because of that. Secondly, what was going on in the major cities he visited? What, um, what would be like a little snapshot you could take of the social and religious life of that given area at the time that he was there in order to maybe get some sense of what uh, the young John Berkman would have seen and where he would have gone. I think it's helpful to put ourselves in that context to know that. And lastly, you know, talk specifically about his arrival in Rome. It is not my intent to put, uh, to, to interject my own sort of wishes about where I would go here, although I admit I have some bias, but we really don't know. Um, we don't have a detailed diary. I wish... I wish that he had left a detailed record for us, like a travel law, where every day he wrote down where he was and what he was doing in great detail, and that I could stand here and read that, read from that to you this morning. Um, historians love that stuff. That's the primary sources. That's the best. But I don't have that, and uh, we do have some great, uh, some great secondary sources that are drawn from bits, his, bits and pieces of his account. He left a diary, he did leave some letters, he did leave something, but we don't have this comprehensive travel log. So, let's, to, let's talk about, about where, he, where he went and what he might have seen and what he might have done. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. But first, the Thirty Years' War. What the heck is going on in Europe? The Thirty Years' War, what the heck is this? As I mentioned, it's, it's a very bloody, brutal conflict that is religiously oriented, religiously started, Started when the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II became emperor the year we're talking about, 1618. And he was Catholic, and so he decreed 
that all of the uh, all the subjects in every single principality of the Holy Roman Empire had to had to be outwardly observant of Roman Catholicism, and this was in direct sort of conflict with a 1555 agreement that had been reached called the Peace of Augsburg. Anybody ever heard of that? Which essentially was um, was whose realm, whose religion. So whatever the religion of the local prince was or the local noble would be the, the official religion of that principality. So the Peace of Augsburg had really been designed to sort of keep this sort of thing from happening. Uh, but when he decreed this, when Ferdinand II decreed this, uh, the triggering event was something called, are you ready for this? The defenestration of Prague. Do y'all know what defenestrate means? Throw out a window. That's exactly what it means. Out the window. It's just a cool word. Did you ever want to start over with something? You know, you can defenestrate. I think that's a great word. So what happens is that right after this uh, Ferdinand II's decree on religion, the Bohemian nobility in present day, what's today the Czech Republic, of course, uh, had in their company three regents of the Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand II, and they threw them out the window of the Prague Castle, of the third floor window of the Prague Castle. And in case you're thinking, well, that's no big deal. I mean, remember, this is a medieval fortress. So um, the, third, the third floor was about a fall of about 100 feet. So they tossed them out the castle window. And these three men lived. And so, of course, all of the Catholics in, in uh, the Czech, well, the Czech Republic, the Bohemia, throughout Bohemia, said that this was the work of, of, of a miracle, the Virgin Mary, or that they were caught by angels. And that circulated, began to circulate very, very quickly. So the Protestant response to that was to publish a pamphlet and say that, um, that there were no angels involved, and there was no Virgin Mary involved. What happened was that these three regents fell into a dung heap. And that's why they survived. <laughs> so, so that propaganda got out there very, very quickly. But this was the triggering event. This is what sparked the entire Thirty Years' War, the beginning of open revolt in the Bohemian states, who then got the, the, the support of Denmark and Sweden and Norway, and, uh, and so we're off to war. We are off to war. Um, you have a fighting in what is today, present day, Austria. Austria didn't exist until the peace treaty that ended this war. You have fighting in Austria, you have fighting down in Transylvania, and you even have the, the uh, Ottoman Muslims fighting on the side of Pro Protestants against Catholic Poles. Think about that. Muslims fighting on the side of Christians against other Christians. So it it's really is a, a pretty, pretty bloody, bloody business. And as I said, that's not all. Typhus and famine were rampant. People were dying of starvation and people were, dry, were dying of disease in large numbers. So yes, is there any question about why he took the route that he did? And can I add just one more thing to that? If war and famine and disease is not enough, how many horsemen of the apocalypse did we mention? Um, if that's not enough, this is also the peak of the great witch hunts of Europe. Between 1600 and 1700, we're burning lots and lots and lots of witches in the Holy Roman Empire. Protestants have the record. They hold the record for witch burning. So uh, that is going on as well. And that's a whole other class, y'all. That's a whole, I could talk for hours about that. Uh, that is a fascinating little social uh, exploration of 17th century Europe. Okay, um, so the major cities he visited, as I mentioned, the first place he goes is Paris. He passed into France. Uh, and from the starting point of Mechelen in uh, Flanders, this would have been approximately 200 miles, because we know he didn't walk this continuously, and you can assume that, that he stopped. There's much about that foot journey from Mechelen to Paris that we do not know. But we know that he spent some time in Paris because this was, of course, the first major uh, notation about his journey, that this is where he spent, that this is where he stopped, the first major notation we have. So France in 1618, particularly Paris, was an incredible city. Uh, this was the France of King Louis XIII, uh, who had just uh, just sort of ditched his um, his regent, cardinal regent, cardinal uh, cardinal 
Richelieu, um, who, had, who had undertaken a great um, campaign of building and revitalization. Uh, this was when the Louvre was expanded. It's when the magnificent Tuileries Palace was built in Paris. So John Bertman would have arrived in a very gleaming, pretty new city of Paris. It was a model of good government, 17th century of France, a model of good government, um, a cultural artistic center. The founder of the Bourbon dynasty, uh, Henry IV, began the process of consolidating, uh, that's Louis XIII's predecessor, by the way, it began the process of consolidating absolutism in the monarchy. So there was good government, there was strong government, centralized power, and brought the French wars of religion to a close long before they started in the Holy Roman Empire. So, as I said, we have the Louvre expanding, we have this great building going on of the Tuileries Palace. You can imagine that those infrastructure improvements would have taken lots of other uh, manifestations, expressions as well. There's, there's no question of that. But um, this was the, the, the finest city in Europe, rivaled really only at this time, in the early 17th century, uh, had a population of about uh, half a million people, rivaled only by London, which had a population of a little bit more than a half a million people. But certainly Paris had already had the reputation of being the artistic and cultural center. So Cardinal Richelieu had just built, I found this interesting, had just built the Church of St. Gervais, which is the first structure, first ecclesiastical structure in France that uses Jesuit architecture. So this would have happened right before uh, John Bertman's journey to France. The cornerstone of that facade was laid by none other than King Louis XIII himself. So this is the France that John Bertman would have seen. What would he have chose, chosen to visit? I mean, you can imagine that the center of, of, of Catholic life, if you think about, about Christianity in France, a Christian heritage that goes back at least 1,300 years at this point, uh, back to the earliest Merovingian kings and their uh, the most Christian kings of France. I mean, it would have been great, great things for him to see. Of course, did he visit Notre Dame Cathedral? We can assume that he did. We can assume that he did. Did he visit Saint Chapelle, uh, built in 1242 by King Saint Louis IX? Uh, did he see the the crown of thorns and the other passion relics that were housed there? Um, you can imagine that he did. Imagine that he did. Incidentally, because this did come up uh, from a previous talk, I want to go back and put a cap on that. Those relics were housed in Saint-Chapelle, but they have not been there since the French Revolution. They were moved to Notre Dame. So um, just that's just a footnote to that. They've been in Notre Dame since the French Revolution, and they are guarded. The, the crown of thorns... Um, there's one of the holy lances, there's about three of them, but anyway, there's one of the holy lances and several other passion relics that are held in Notre Dame that, um, this is a little point of interest to some of us, that are guarded uh, and protected and, and cared for by the equestrian order of the Knights of the, the equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. So um, every Friday, uh, they are responsible for, for curating that. So we can assume that he would have visited Notre Dame, we can assume that he would have visited uh, Saint Chapelle, and then from Paris, and, and no doubt the Jesuit house. There was a Jesuit house there uh, that was established in the early 17th century, um, and this may have been where he stayed, um, but we have no way of knowing that, of course. Then he traveled to Lyon. Lyon is a city uh, a distance of about 300 miles from Paris. So this was a little bit more of a journey than from Mechlin. It's a city that dates to Roman times, ancient, ancient place, an ancient Celtic settlement there that even the Roman historian Cassius mentions, uh, named for the god, uh, the pagan god Lu, he says. So it's been there since pre-Christian times. Um, we know that there was a thriving early community of Christians in Lyon because of the sheer number of martyrs that come from there in the first centuries martyred during the reigns of Marcus Aurelius and um, Septimus Severus during those imperial reigns, uh, including, of course, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who may have been martyred. Uh, I think the Eastern Church commemorates him as a martyr. Um, 
we don't have a date of his martyrdom. We don't know that he was martyred, but that's a common tradition that's associated with him. Something that would have been keen on St. John Berkman's mind, however, when he went to Lyon, is the horrible bloodshed that had just taken place in Lyon and, and in Paris, for that matter, in 1572. Just 27 years before John Berkman was born, there was, again, another product of Protestant Catholic tensions in the wars of religion, something called the St. Bartholomew's Eve Massacre that took place across France uh, in the major cities. This was a Catholic-led massacre of Protestants. Um, there was a large, large number of casualties in Paris, but the worst hit was Lyon. Thousands of people dead. Uh, that would have been probably very fresh on his mind. Um, so the Cathedral of Lyon, we can imagine that he would have seen, perhaps. <laughs> we can be sure that he probably visited because it's dedicated to St. John the Baptist. It's dedicated to St. John the Baptist, for whom St. John Berkman is named. So we can assume that he went here. The original church, uh, this is a, a 12th century structure, but the original church was established there by St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Uh, it's where his relics were held. There was another structure built on top of the original one in the 6th century, and then this 11th uh, century, early 12th century structure replaced that. You can imagine that, that John Burton would have gone here, but, but here's what's interesting. Let's talk about what he wouldn't have seen. What he wouldn't have seen at the Cathedral of Lyon is the relics of St. Irenaeus. Because those were completely and utterly destroyed by the French Calvinist in 1562. So he would not have seen the shrine of St. Irenaeus. This Protestant legacy, I think, of division and, and the violence that ensued because of that would have no doubt made an impression on him. And remember that the Jesuits were pledged to the defense of the faith. So this would have definitely tugged on him, I think it's fair to say. Okay, so from Lyon, he traveled to Milan, a distance of nearly 300 miles on foot. Another ancient Celtic town, this is actually one of the furthest places, settlements, furthest southern settlements that the Celts were, that we're aware of. Again, prehistoric, but they entered the history here at about 600 BC, so a very old place. Uh, Milan, the name of course, comes from the uh, Mediolanum, which means um, sanctuary, sanctuary, a great Christian city. Again, it was here that the Emperor Constantine the Great decreed the Edict of Milan, which extended religious toleration to all Christians throughout the, the empire. Uh, 313 is the year that happened. And effectively ending, of course, the major persecutions. This was also the home of a sainted bishop, Ambrose, who died uh, in the late 4th century, who baptized St. Augustine, and who is, of course, one of the four Latin doctors of the church. Surely, St. John Berkman would have visited the Basilica of St. Ambrose, where his shrine is. We can imagine that he would have. Absolutely would have. So from Milan, he went to Loreto. On to Loreto, a journey of another 275 miles or so. Why Loreto? The city, originally part of the Papal States, um, had recently been fortified in 1586, um, walled, fortified by Pope Sixtus V, um, particularly because of uh, the Italian wars that had raged up and down the, the peninsula and something that he felt like needed to be protected there in Loreto. It had been a popular pilgrimage site since at least the 13th century uh, when a basilica in Loreto was built to enshrine the holy house. The holy house. Now that is the, the shrine, not the holy house. The holy house is inside. Uh, within this magnificent marble shrine is believed to be the house of the Blessed Virgin Mary that was taken from Nazareth. <coughs> And it has a, a strong tradition in the West dating to at least the time of the Crusades. Um, we know that, it, of course, it's still a, a major site of, of Marian pilgrimage and certainly would have been for John Bartman. His father mentioned he had a great devotion to the Virgin Mary. The tradition about the Holy House, though, as I said, it, it really dates to about the First Crusade that it was taken from Nazareth and, uh, and brought to Loreto. There's two different versions of that story, how it ended up there, but um, 
The tradition is that the, the house in Nazareth was originally converted to a church by the apostles themselves and was in use uh, for that very purpose when um, St. Helena made her expedition to the Holy Land in the early 4th century and that she afforded, apparently ordered a church built atop it. So, again, that is, that is strong tradition, and that existed until the Crusader era when it was taken uh, to Loreto. So we can imagine that, right? And then, of course, he goes <coughs> on to Rome. This journey would be the last leg, um, literally and figuratively, I suppose. It was a journey of about 170 miles. And he arrived, on, as I mentioned, on December 31st of 1618. He arrived at Il Gesù, the Jesuit church, Jesuit mother church uh, in Rome on New Year's Eve. So, you can imagine, I mean, what his relief would have been, this journey of 75 days over some pretty uh, brutal terrain, certainly crossing through the Alps. We know exactly the mountain pass that he went through, the Rome Valley. And he would have been, no doubt, greatly relieved uh, to be to have finally arrived, um, but certainly would have been pensive about what lay ahead of him because he was going to enter study, further study with the Jesuit order uh, at the Roman College, uh, which is somewhat what it might have looked like uh, in Berkman's day, perhaps. The school originally established uh, by St. Ignatius of Loyola, later renamed Gregorian University for the, for the patron there, uh, Pope Gregory XIII, who authorized uh, the construction of this in 1581. And it was a great academic center of the time, not just because it was a Jesuit center, but because they invited in all sorts of people to lecture and speak, come do guest talks, and perhaps one of its most famous guest lecturers was Galileo Galilei, who had just given a public lecture here in 1616. So there's no doubt that that would have sort of been on everyone's radar, because it was the lecture that he gave at the Roman College that earned him his first warning to stop teaching Copernican theory, to stop teaching heliocentrism. Right, that the, that the earth revolves around the sun. He received his first warning about that after his talk at the Roman College. So as most of you already know, by the time of St. John Berkman's death, he was already known for his holiness, um, striving for excellence in even the smallest of things, is what all of his contemporaries say about him, and was much loved by um, not just all of his confreres, but everyone who knew him uh, loved him is said. In total, as I said, he spent just two years and eight months in Rome until his death on August 13th of 1621 at the age of 22. What a journey, right? What a journey. And I know perhaps that Father Peter has some things he'd like to add. Maybe. <laughs> I thought all I'd have to do is hand you the microphone. <laughs> Which I, yeah, there you go. And did everybody see their, their holy cards? Yes. Did y'all know that that's a map of 1618 Europe behind him? No. Well, there's a little trivia for you. Oh, yeah, okay. And we plan on um, sending the holy card, um, physical holy cards, as well as the digital holy card to a number of our uh, friends around the world who have churches and um, schools named after our patron saint, St. John Berkman's. I like that this is up. This is my alma mater. This is where I went to school, the Gregorian University. Looks a little different, doesn't it? it uh, <laughs> no. The piazza does. You know, the Trevi Fountain is, uh, you know, go down this yeah. way. and just, I mean, just literally two blocks away. So that kind of gives you a situation of uh, uh, situating it in the actual city. And St. John Berkman's, I mean, uh, so Dottie actually went to Loreto, yes. so saw the, the house of 
of Mary there, so she's done something before I did it. Uh, I look forward to going there because it was a sight. And he, um, there are, uh, so St. John Berkman did write about his experience in Loreto because he had just been there and then did the final leg of his journey um, to Rome. So it was Christmas. He was there for Christmas Eve of uh, 1618. And, and you may recall uh, two years ago when we had the Heart of St. John Berkman's here, right after uh, that was Christmas, and I, I gave some excerpts from that. Um, so there are a lot of beautiful things that are mentioned about his actual journey. And when he arrived to uh, the church called Jesu, literally it means Jesus, but it means Jesus in the sense of the holy name of Jesus. You know, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend, etc., etc. So when they go there, it's not just, I, I, oh yeah, I, I go to Jesus, where do you go? You know, it's, it's the sense of the holy name of Jesus. And it's, you know, you walk in, it's a beautiful church. On the right, for those of you who have been to Rome, and you might remember the, the, the hand, the, the forearm, the blessing arm of St. Francis Xavier is there. And on the left, St. Ignatius of Loyola is buried. And it's only about a half mile away where there's a church called St. Ignatius. St. Ignatius um, uh, is buried in Il Gesù, the Jesus. Um, and, um, and that particular church, St. Ignatius, is the first one in the world that was built after his canonization. Um, and it was in that church that our patron was buried and is buried. Uh, along with St. Aloysius Gonzaga, St. Robert Bellarmine, and, and a few others who are buried there. And that church, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the city of Rome, has that fake dome. You know, this is the church that when you walk into it, you look up and it's like, oh, okay, that looks like a nice dome. Well, it's painted from the perspective of being way in the back of the church, so that when you're literally under it, it looks like the whole dome is... Is falling upon you, back towards you, and when you're standing there, to your right in that transept of the church is Saint Aloysius Gonzaga, and to the left is our patron saint, Saint John Berkman's, and that church is literally physically attached to what is called the Roman College. So Saint John arrived, and his companion arrived, and by the way, his companion died even uh, sooner than Saint John Berkman's. Another story as well. Um, but the, 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 so after they arrive, then they go just, uh, like I said, about a half mile away in the direction of the Pantheon, which certainly he would have seen as well, and um, uh, started his studies. That's, so it's called the Roman College, but there was also a place where you live and you study and you're part of the formation uh, in the Jesuit order then. So... Um, back to the Jesuits and why he chose the Jesuits, um, part of the conflict that also existed in Flanders and, and all the lowlands, uh, the, the low country, the Netherlands, um, um, and then you have the influence of King Philip II down in Spain, and, um, and there are other religious orders that are there, but it was the Jesuits who came to this little particular area of Flanders. So he would have been exposed to the um, pre-monster tensions. They're the ones who are dressed in all white. They kind of look like they're walking around as if the Pope. Um, <laughs> the Norbertines is another way of uh, referring to them because they were founded by St. Norbert. Um, he, would have, uh, he was influenced by them, uh, very much so. Said Mass, not, I mean, serve Mass, excuse me, uh, early in the morning uh, in Deist. That's, uh, he loved to serve. Uh, to assist at Mass, and would do so several times a day if he could, and then would get to the um, um, to the kind of makeshift school, and then he, he joins, see, seminary back there, especially early on, it wasn't that you went to a seminary, you would go be with a priest who would help teach you uh, what it was like to be a priest, and here's the life of a pastor, and so, so there was more of an um, apprenticeship, really, um, Except more and more, the university systems developed, and, and then you would have people like our patron uh, being sent to study uh, in, in these places of uh, higher education. 
a number of popes have come from this uh, particular uh, institution as well, and, and even more saints. So he, he makes his journey uh, all the way, uh, as Cheryl uh, outlined for us, gets to Rome, and he, he so loved the example of St. Aloysius Gonzaga, who had died in 1593. Remember, St. John Berkman's was born in 1599, so six years old, and he's hearing all about this young guy who just died in Rome and how sad that he died. He was so holy. He was a, uh, he, he could have been a prince. He came from a royal family, and he told his family, nope, I don't want to, to become a, a prince and continue this. I want to join the Jesuits. I mean, that, that blew their mind. And oftentimes when you see St. Saint, Saint Aloysius Gonzaga uh, depicted in any type of uh, religious art, you'll see him with a crown at his foot. Oftentimes he's dressed as if a seminarian serving mass, so he has his cassock and surplus, and, and a crown at his foot. Sometimes the crown is upside down, Sometimes he even has his foot on it. It's like a footstool. You know, th th that's what the crown means to me. And so, you know, again, picture the church, St. Ignatius of Loyola there, and there's St. Aloysius over there, and St. John Berkman's. You got this guy who was from this regal royal family, uh, left all that behind. You have St. John Berkman's over here. His father was a what? Archer. Weaver, no. Cobbler, shoes. But you didn't. So anyway, no, shoemaker. So shoemaker, shoemaker. He was a shoemaker. And I will say this, I love it because the shrine of St. John Berkman's in Deist, um, the birth home, is literally surrounded by a shoe store today. It's great. Now, I mean, it's, you know, you've been to places before in the world where, you know, the, the city would have destroyed something older and they would, but they didn't want to destroy. It's on St. John Berkman Street. Um, um, the, this particular uh, a shrine of his birth home. And so you have the, the prince and the pauper, as it were. You have the, you know, a, but both can be raised to the dignity of the altar. It has nothing to do with your, your upbringing, your finances, your anything. Holiness of life, quite the contrary, is something very different. So, I mean, you can even just see that right there. Um, St. Stanislaus Kostka is buried not too far away from there as well. So he was the first of the young Jesuit saints. And a lot of these uh, plaques that we have up here, especially in this section behind um, those banners, uh, have three saints together. And Saint Stanislaus Kostka uh, was also from a wealthy family from Poland, born in 1550, died in 1568, the same year that uh, Aloysius was born, 1568, and then he dies in 1593. And then shortly after that, we have Saint John Berkman. So back to back to back, we have these young, unbelievably great, holy saints. But Saint John grew up and uh, wanted to be another Saint Aloysius. So even in the litany of Saint John Berkman's, it says, you know, faithful imitator of Aloysius. Um, and when he arrives to not just the Jesu, but then the Roman College, it, uh, you know, th th there's a great welcome because they knew that these, these kids, these two uh, uh, novices were arriving. And lo and behold, he is put into the room of Saint Aloysius. So he was able to, that that's where he lived, that's where he studied, and right now, that particular floor, the section of that, of the Roman college, is preserved to this day, and it is a shrine to, to both of the saints, and so any time that I take pilgrims to, to Rome, we always go to his tomb, obviously, and then you just, you know, I told you the building is attached to it. We, we go, like, literally next to it, go up these flight of steps, kind of walk around the, 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 uh, the, the, the edge of, um, um, of the 
courtyard. You can see the courtyard down there. Go to the other side and you get to the rooms and now there's a beautiful chapel and a lot of relics there, a place where where they would have made their their vows, the chapel there. So, I mean, it, it's, it's really uh, very beautiful and there's such a devotion to them in both Flanders and in uh, Rome that they want to preserve all of these things intact so that the pilgrims can go and... In fact, at some point, I do want to actually have some type of a pilgrimage, and maybe some of you will be on it, uh, where we start off in Belgium, take a flight to Brussels, get off there, um, and literally the airport has a train station attached to it, where you go down the escalator, get on the train, and it'll take you to, uh, to Deest, and stay there, go to the place of his baptism, First Holy Communion, uh, where he lived, and then uh, go to some of these other sites um, that, that we say were made holy by uh, St. John Berkman's. And then uh, try to make some type of uh, a little bit of the trek. Um, on foot. On foot, 75 days. Um, <laughs> it's a different Camino. <laughs> you know, we could do that. Uh, I would love it, actually. Um, so... Um, so I think that that kind of gives a lot of the highlights of what was going on 400 years ago at this time. And, and we'll, I plan on making mention of it at times in the homilies uh, coming up. Um, um, and what we will do also, as you can understand, is in, since he died in 1621, well, 2021 is three years away, not even three years away when you really think about it. Um, and... So we will, we will begin the 400th anniversary of his death um, and, and commemorate it and, and celebrate it and really try to highlight his life and the holiness of his life. And so we'll start that probably on August 13th, the actual day of his death, um, um, 2020, because then that's the 400th year culminating with the actual 400th anniversary of his death. And... Um, so you'll hear more about him in a couple of years' time. So what about uh, Cheryl's presentation or what I have said or anything that you've always wanted to know about St. John Berkman's but never knew? Yes, Father James. Um, I wonder if there was no option of transportation provided to uh, John Berkman's. Uh, was it entirely his decision to go on foot, or was there some other option? I don't know if there was anything offered. I, I don't, I, I wish I could say that this was something out of his piety, wanting to go by foot and make that journey, but that was a common, it was a common thing to do, and since the Jesuits were already um, flourishing throughout that part of Europe, what he would do in many of instances was literally go from Jesuit house to Jesuit house. And actually, the reverse was done after his death. Remember, they didn't take his body, but they took his heart. And the Jesuits... So, the, the, we hear about the reaction of the Jesuits to John Berkman's coming through because they wrote about it when his heart came back. It's like, oh, no, you're kidding. He died? What? I mean, he was, he was a, a, a saint. He was, you know, he was, he was going to be one of the great, you know, St. John Berkman's, uh, he wanted to go either to China, following the footsteps of St. Uh, Francis Xavier, or to the New World, where so many of the other Jesuits, like St. Peter Claver, ended up in uh, Colombia and was canonized with him on the same day uh, in 1888. Um, so uh, we do know that he stopped, uh, the two of them stopped at many of the Jesuit houses on the way down to Rome, and indeed, um, uh, his heart. And, and literally, they venerated his heart. I mean, they got down on their knees. I mean, that there was already a sense of, of veneration that this was a holy person. And so St. John Berkman's, he was the oldest of five children, kind of like me, um, Hopefully there are other areas that overlap. <laughs> um, um, 
And indeed, he was named after St. John the Baptist. His father also had the name John. His father, we heard that he died just shortly before uh, St. John uh, began this journey. His father was a priest. What? No way. Yes, his wife had died. So St. John Berkman's mother had already died much earlier which was one of the reasons his dad didn't want him to go off to the Jesuits. You, you, you're the oldest, you gotta stay back, you gotta help me make these shoes to get the money to take care of the other four. Uh, when the others were able to be uh, taken care of um, by others, aunts, relatives, and all, um, it made it easier for St. John to go off to the Jesuit novitiate, and then obviously with his father's death and his, his siblings being taken care of, um, uh, he, he totally went with uh, no, no, nothing holding him back, 100% Jesuit, want to be a missionary, uh, probably thought he'd never make his way back. Now, here's a kind of a, a little, all right, maybe, no, I think it's true. So, okay, so St. John Berkman's was canonized uh, January 15th, uh, 1888. Angelo Roncalli was born in 1881. Who is Angelo Roncalli? We know him by the name of John the 23rd. John. He took the name John. John the 23rd was a name already taken, by the way, and a number taken, but he was an antipope. And no one had taken the name John ever, ever since the antipope. Uh, so here he is, seven years of age, a new, brand spanking newly uh, uh, canonized saint. Now for us, I mean, well, we just had seven canonizations this past Sunday. You know, in the, in the time of Leo the Thirteenth, he canonized, and this is the second longest pontificate after Pius the Ninth, he canonized ten people. Ten. We just had seven canonized last weekend. I mean, Pope Francis has already canonized like four or five hundred people. We need to so. strike while the iron's hot on that. <laughs> our five Shreveport martyrs. Right. Yeah, we're, we need our, our Shreveport martyrs. How do we get them on the list? Recognized. <laughs> so, um, so this young <clears throat> Angelo would have been, uh, he would have known the story. Absolutely. And, and I'm not just speculating here, he writes in the Journal of a Soul, uh, he was writing all of this as a, as a young priest, and then as a bishop, then all of a sudden uh, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and he takes the name John. He writes about how, oh my beloved John, he, he, he was his special patron. Angelo Roncalli loved John Berkman's. It is, it's written throughout his, and not just like when he was a young seminarian, but even when he was the Pope. Now, when asked, he will say, he said, that it was, he took the name after St. John the Baptist. Um, but this is where the speculation comes in. I think there was a really special love, I know he had a love for St. John Berkman's, that, that gave him even uh, more cause to take the name John. So, anyways, for what it's worth. Um, Don, did you have a... What is the uh, first recorded miracle associated with St. John Berkman? The first recorded miracle took place when his body was, was laid out on, on the, uh, the bier. The, um, uh, it would not have been a coffin. But, um, and literally, there was such a devotion to him already that they took pieces of cloth from his cassock and they took so much cloth that they had to take his body to the back to the sacristy and put another uh, cassock on him. Hmm. At which point they, di they discovered that his little pinky toe, it's going to sound horrible, had been removed. People already wanted a relic. Some of his hair had been taken, a, a lot of different things. I mean, it was... Uh, um, but people were there that they just wanted to, to, to touch him. And, and this is the rich, the poor, the, 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 the cardinals, the, the, the hierarchy of the church knew about this young guy across town from the Vatican uh, who died. Well, okay, 
So th this is the Gregorian University, but not far from there is the Roman College, um, who died, and they went there, th this church called St. Ignatius, and uh, Aloysius was buried there already, and St. John, uh, no, I almost said St. Robert Bellarmine was already buried there, but he was soon to be buried there. Uh, anyhow, everyone wanted to go and see him, and normally you're buried, the day you die, you're buried. Back then, that was what took place. But then they realized, whoa, we can't bury him yet. There's way too much of a devotion. Not everyone got to see him. This one woman who wanted to, to go and just kind of touch uh, him and pray through his intercession, she was blind. She couldn't get there. The next day, uh, she was able to get there and, and took his fingers, touched her eyes with his fingers, she was immediately cured. Now this is in front of ecclesiastical officials, right then and there, they knew the woman, they knew her to be blind. Um, she was well known, immediately spontaneous, miraculous cure took place then and there, and it is recognized as the first miracle. In fact, in the, in Deist, uh, in, the, in the church called Saint Sulpice, I mean, he's not, he was baptized and, and, and uh, the church there, all the way in the back to the left. Um, and by the way, our high altar mimics the altar of this chapel in Deist in honor of St. John Berkman. Um, uh, God, I have way too many things to say. Uh. <laughs> um, where was I going with that, Don? Miracles associated with them. Okay, great. There we go. So, thank you. Um, I don't even know why I went there. So anyway, so, uh, the, oh, okay, because in the chapel, there's this big, huge painting of that very first miracle. The woman, in fact, I would like for you all to verify. Okay, Father James, you see uh, St. John Berkman's yeah. on, in a coffin there? Yeah. Belma? Not yet, okay. Well, and you yeah, see yeah. the woman there? She's holding her, her fingers to her eyes. She's looking up. She can see. Uh, yeah. So since you mentioned it, okay, everyone, can you kind of see it right there? You know, so it, it's the first miracle. And yeah, I have it as my screensaver. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping someone would ask. No, no. <laughs> so... Um, and then there's another miracle of a sister, a religious sister, uh, in Flanders um, who had prayed through her intercession. And we all know the third miracle. Um, the third official miracle. Keep in mind that there are many recorded miracles through the intercession of St. John Berkman's. But the third one was, was right here in our state, Grand Coteau. So let, let me situate it for you. So, so you have... Uh, these Jesuits, they are, they're, they're being beatified, they're being canonized. Uh, St. Aloysius was already uh, canonized. And then St. John Berkman's cause is, is progressing very nicely. Remember, with St. Aloysius, when he died, uh, it was like 25 years later that the rector of that place starts writing, writing, writing all about the life and death and the holiness of St. Aloysius. And hey, any of you classmates, if you remember anything, come and tell me, and if you have things, because so many people immediately took all of the books and writings and everything, the personal effects of St. Aloysius, they were gone. When St. John Berkman's died, they closed the room. They grabbed all of his stuff, all of his writings, all of his books, all of his uh, personal materials, and immediately, okay, remember last week and the conversation that you had and last month, and remember when he arrived just a couple of years ago? So everything was far more fresh in their, in their minds. It was written, written, written. So, so we have an unbelievably great firsthand accounts of, of his life and, and of his death, which is how we know that the scene on the high altar is very real to life because they wrote about how many people were in the room, what happened when he bounded up on his knees from the mattress, which was on the floor that he had asked for it to be there and how he fell back and he would have collapsed had it not been for two who grabbed him under his arms and he was able to receive Holy Communion and made a, an unbelievably great uh, act of faith in the presence of our Lord in the Eucharist, uh, all uh, unscripted Latin, um, 
text, and they, they, they quickly wrote everything down. And so, so here's the process of canonization, and then the Jesuits are disbanded by Pope Clement XIV, who, in an unbelievably great irony, so here is uh, the Gregorian University. If you walk down through this piazza, right down here, and you take a left, there's another church, because there's churches everywhere over there. And in that church, it's uh, dedicated to the 12 apostles, but buried there are Philip and Simon, um, uh, James, Philip James, James the Lesser. Lesser. Yeah. James the Lesser. Uh, but when you walk in, and the, all the way to the back and to the left, is the tomb of Pope Clement XIV, the very person who suppressed the Jesuits. And this is like their major... Uh, uh, so we students visited that tomb often. So, okay, I digress. So, so that, that's a little bit more about um, our patron and how they knew him and the Jesuit order is suppressed. But people are still praying through his intercession. So he doesn't get canon, he doesn't get beatified as quickly as the others do because the order is suppressed. And, and they stop looking at any of, uh, of, there are no Jesuits that are canonized or beatified in a, uh, like a hundred year span, but once they're back in the favor of the church and they, um, and, and like Cheryl said, it was all for politics, especially Spain and Portugal, uh, that they were kind of at each other's throats, especially regarding the missionary activity in the New World, like Argentina, Brazil, that whole. Um, so it wasn't for um, ecclesi uh, ecclesiological or uh, theological reasons why the, the Jesuits were suppressed. It was all political. So now they're back in the favor of the church, and all these miracles keep happening. And so, uh, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth canonizes, uh, excuse me, beatifies John Berkman's in 1865. 1865. So civil war is going on over here. He is beatified. The everyone would have heard about it because I mean, you know, once word finally got to all the convents and seminaries and different Jesuit places. There's a Jesuit place in Grand Coteau. They would have found out about it. That place, by the way, is the novitiate is called St. Stanislaus Kostka. So a lot of people don't realize that it's the first of the three young Jesuit saints. Um, and, and, and behind the Jesuit um, novitiate and that area that's still there right now in Grand Coteau, so about a, a mile behind are the Madams of the, of the Sacred Heart. And... Uh, one of the, the young sisters, well, she's not even a sister, she's a novice, uh, is literally at the point of death and on the ninth day of a novena through the intercession of this newly beatified John Berkman's, um, she is cured. So now we're in 1866. And of course, 150 years later, it's 2016, which is why we had his heart here in this state um, uh, for that anniversary. And so... So that miracle takes place. I am an eyewitness of those papers because I did something I wasn't supposed to do in the Vatican Secret Archives. Um, and I requested those papers even though that wasn't a part of our scope of research, but it I still got this. against us for the number, anyway. It, it actually did count against us because you can only have a certain number of requests per day and, and something, anyways. Yeah. Um, but I saw them. I saw them. I wanted to see them. I saw them. So they're there. Um, and, and of course, so you have, that's 1866. It's 22 years later that he's canonized the same, 1888. Um, and then 14 years later, the, uh, they, they separate, uh, the, the community separates. It's only 28 years after Holy Trinity and the 1873 um, yellow fever epidemic. They create this new church on, well, as you know, on Texas Avenue, and uh, they name it after the most recently canonized saint with a with a, a a relation to the state of Louisiana itself. First church in the world, St. John Berkman's, and of course now the only cathedral. I was in Chicago, as I mentioned to you, 
And just a couple of days ago, literally walking on Michigan Avenue towards uh, Millennium Park, and all of a sudden I saw this uh, cut out white uh, board of Pope Francis as I'm walking and there's a shop and I, I see it and then there's a statue of Mary and I look up, it's a, um, a Paulist press. Um, and the sisters uh, were in there and everything and we chatted and I said, I'm from the cathedral, uh, rector of the cathedral of St. John Berkman's. Oh, what a beloved saint. Yeah, she had like a little Irish accent. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh good, you've heard of him. Well, of course we've heard of him, because everyone in religious communities know one of the very famous things that St. John Berkman said. He said, my penance is living in community. <laughs> everyone knows that little phrase of St. John Berkman. Uh, I remember uh, when Cardinal Avery Dulles, a Jesuit himself, He's one of those who's a priest who never becomes a bishop, but he's, he's chosen to be a cardinal after the age of 80. And, and he, he also quoted that. And, uh, and then I remember him saying, yeah, and, uh, and he was probably unbearable to live with. <laughs> and I mean, people, and if, so she even said that. She said, uh, this nun in uh, uh, Chicago, she said, oh yeah, oh my goodness, we have some unbelievably beautiful, wonderful, holy, pious uh, sisters, and they can be the most difficult ones to get along with. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not because of them, per se, it's because, well, we want to do it this way, and, and yet they're just, oh no, you know, everything <laughs> nice, simple, that this. So, so, St. John Berkman's, yes. Um, all right, I've given you the opportunity to talk and I keep monopolizing the opportunity. Uh, any other final questions, and then we'll uh, break for yeah, us. I need to make two quick announcements, if I can. Uh, Anybody have another question before I jump in? One final uh, comment or question. What did these young Jesuits die of? Okay, so he died, uh, St. John Berkman's, what did the Jesuits die of? And the three were, uh, had different things. St. Aloysius, there was a, an epidemic going on in the city of Rome, and he, very similar to our five uh, uh, yellow fever priests, he went in uh, at a time of the epidemic and, and without regard to his own health, ultimately contracted the disease and died. Now, of course, yellow, the yellow fever priests here, they thought that by being with these individuals who were sick, that they would contract the disease as you normally do. They didn't realize it was mosquitoes around. So, so when they went to them, they're like, okay, it's all right. We're going to go in, and we know that we are going to um, um, be even more susceptible to the disease. Well, they were because they were where all the mosquitoes were, but it wasn't that they literally contracted uh, that disease. St. John Berkman's, he died on uh, August 13th. August in Rome is very, very, very super hot, especially with all the cobblestones and marble and everything else around there. And so... Um, in fact, to this day, a lot of Romans leave town. It's called Ferragosto, the, the, the Roman ho holidays, the August holidays. Um, but he stayed in town. It was, uh, he, he, was, he was already f uh, feeling ill, but he was told, you know, he, by obedience, he is known to be a, a, a great saint of obedience. And, and listening to and the letter of the law that he was told to do. And so it was time to go to school. It was time to do this work order. It was time to do whatever. And he did it even though, and he would constantly fast. And so even in the, in the time of illness and fasting, the heat of the, of the summer, um, and then he went to defend a, a particular paper that he had written and was uh, at the Greek College, which is actually just down the, no, no, not far from the Gregorium, um, and, and just got so weak and ill that that is ultimately what led to his death. So it wasn't a disease per se. Um, it, was, it was just some type of an illness uh, exacerbated by the heat of Rome and just by his just constantly going, going, going doing, and, um, and yeah, so he died, and like I said, it was almost 400 years ago, and 
and we will learn more and more about not just his death, but obviously his life, his holiness of life. And uh, with that, I am going to conclude. Hang on just for a second for a couple of more announcements, and I'll see many of you at Mass in 15 minutes.